This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so welcome to class. And uh, many many people they wanted uh, to uh, do uh, that I should take class on this topic. Therefore, uh, I am taking it. Okay, so uh, viral infections and pregnancy. So what really happens? So what could be the more uh, common viral infections that can uh, produce a rash? Okay, so um, I have taken this from Public Health England. Uh, there is a document of. 2016 i think so this is the picture from there so these are the few things where a rash can happen during pregnancy okay so it is a uh, uh, the parvo b19 measles rubella varicella herpes and enterovirus okay so today in our class we'll be discussing this parvo measles rubella varicella and cytomegalovirus but enterovirus and epstein -Barr, barr virus as these are not important these are not very common causes and also uh, <coughs> from the uh, point of view of exam questions are also not coming so that that are not included fine so whenever a rash can happen during pregnancy okay so there will be two kind of rashes it is important to know this because that will help you in answering of your question fine <coughs> sorry for that okay so two type of usually you will find that uh, rashes are uh, defined in two types these are vesicular rash and these and maculopapular rash so vesicular rash so these are the vesicle and these are uh, vesicles we all have seen chicken pox vesicles so we know it so if any time you find in your question they are saying vesicular rash so you are dealing with varicella and herpes okay varicella and herpes i would not discuss today why because there is a guidelines are already there so and you know that those guidelines okay so and second type of rash that can happen during pregnancy will be maculopapular rash now these are the three situation where this kind of rash occurs it could be in the rubella it could be in the um, needles or it could be in the parvovirus now these are two pictures so upper one this picture this is showing vesicular rash so usually when they say vesicular rash the picture becomes clear in our head because we all have seen this uh, this kind of vesicle so if it is ves vesicular rash you, there are two differential diagnoses for you and if your question says about maculopapular rash picture down below here last picture this is showing maculopapular rash even we are uh, these are uh, these kind of rash also we have seen in our clinics because we have seen patient with measles also okay so this kind of rash usually happens so these are two kinds of rash that can happen in the pregnancy and with the only with this you with this word and with this differential uh, diagnosis um, you will be able to answer your question the, uh, this from this topic uh, you know you may get one or two uh, sba or one emq but but that one question also makes important uh, importance you know therefore to know this topic is important fine so these are two kind of rashes now uh, I'll be discussing uh, uh, this fetal infections. So cytomegalovirus, okay. So uh, cytomegalovirus is one of the most common congenital infection. So a uh, question comes, which is the most common congenital infection in UK? Your answer will be CMV, okay. So this from first line, usually question comes. Second line question comes about the incidence as well. So incidence is 0.5 to 2 percent, and it is one of the leading cause of childhood deafness. So why is so much of worries about this cytomegalovirus? It is because of the long-term disability, and this being the leading cause for childhood deafness. Okay. Now uh, you will get question from all these lines. So uh, um, usually when the patient gets this during pregnancy, why we are so much worried? because you know it do have a, um, a vertical transmission and this is a common question that uh, you will find that uh, these percentages are important 
I have put a separate slide for the percentages as well. So it will be 40% in first and second trimester. Okay. So in uh, 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 rate is 40%, but it increases to 80% in third trimester. So as pregnancy progresses, rate of transmission increases from 40 in first and second to 80 in third trimester. This is important to know. Why? Because you will get questions from this percentages. Okay. Then uh, it is a cause for fetal damage, but fetal damage usually occurs in 10% of the cases. So um, a number like 25% of the uh, babies, they will get this infection. But out of those 25%, only 10% will be showing all the long-term disabilities or infections. Fine. Then uh, it, you, in cytomegalovirus, though if the cytomegalovirus is there, it gives uh, uh, lifelong immunity, but the recurrent infections are also there. So um, sometimes you will find this question also, what is the transmission rate in, in recurrent infections? So your answer will be one to two percent, one to two percent. So uh, actually for the cytomegalovirus, there has been a talk in 2009, there has been a talk in 2016 and also there had been as SIP. Okay, so there are three sources are there, but usually whatever I have seen questions, maximum question comes from the percent percentage of the 2009 talk. Okay, whatever the additional percentages were there in 2016 talk that I have already included here. Okay, so this uh, like this whole uh, slide is real important because from every line you will get question fine now uh, it is also important to know how this cmv transmits so usually it is through the body fluids fine why it is important because you may get a question in part two but in part three it is a role pair station where role pair ask the question from where I got I get this in, from where I get this infection from. So this is the way of transmission. So uh, it could be with the uh, body fluids, it could be respiratory droplets, it could be you know vertical infection, it could be by feces and urine and uh, by kissing. The, all these are the modes of transmission. Therefore, those who are working in the um, uh, like uh, nurseries, those who are taking care of the babies, they are usually advised to uh, like do, not to share their cutleries and not to kiss the infect ch ch child. Okay, so these are the ways uh, with which uh, they can reduce the risk of transmission. So you can only tell your patient how we can reduce it when you know how it is trans, um, transmitted. So it is with the help of, um, from the, via the body fluids. So these are the various method ways by which CMV transmission occurs. Now uh, uh, we are worried about mother and we are worried about uh, baby. So what can happen in mother? So in 90% of the cases, the, um, a woman, she will have this infection CMV, but it will be unnoticed, okay, because 90% of the cases are asymptomatic. Apart from this, some non specific symptom may occur. So, what are these symptoms? So, there could be fatigue, arthralgia, myalgia, headache, pharyngitis, rhinitis. Like any viral, even we do, if we have any kind of viral infection or common cold. All these symptoms are there. So these are non-specific symptoms. So usually when this infection occurred to mother, it goes unnoticed. Now, why we are worried? We are worried about baby because she's a pregnant mother. So what can happen with this? Um, what can happen? Uh, what damages can be done to baby by this CMV? So that is more important. So it, you know, it causes so many things. And every line of this slide is important because you know you will find question from everywhere. So it is important to know. So you know if, uh, this is a just a pictorial representation so that you can remember. So it affects eyes. Okay. So with the eyes, what can happen? There could be chorioretinitis, microphthalmus, cataract, and optic atrophy. So uh, so this is the eye thing can happen. 
apart from this we already know it is a one of the cause for the deafness so sensory neural deafness occurs and it occurs in 12 percent of the cases and this 12 uh, this percentage is uh, percentage i have put from 2016 talk okay because you may get question from this percentage also somewhere i have seen this question apart from this it affects uh, lung liver and splenic tissues so if it is affecting liver lung and spleen so hepatomegaly jaundice uh, thrombocytopenic purpura all these issues related with lung uh, liver and spleen is going to happen now come to brain what can happen to uh, baby's head so there could be microcephaly but if microcephaly is there so mental retardation long-term disability epilepsy cerebral uh, cerebral palsy all these things are likely to happen cerebral palsy can occur in eight percent of the cases and this eight percent uh, you have to remember this is again from 2016 talk okay and also it can cause iugr but severe infection does not occur after 14 weeks of the pregnancy because organogenesis usually takes place in the first uh, the first uh, 20 weeks of pregnancy or first 12 weeks of pregnancy okay so severity uh, severe infection does not occur after 14 weeks so this is important to know so if you could just remember this picture remembering this picture only you will be able to learn that what it can happen so just remember grossly it affects uh, baby's brain it affects eyes it affects ear and also it affects liver and spleen so if you could remember this much only so you'll be able to uh, remember even just see this picture and keep this picture in your head so you'll be able to remember that what it can do to to baby okay and uh, this percentages to remember these two percentages in the picture that is deafness 12 percent and palsy eight percent uh, okay so this is uh, uh, this uh, this cmv can do so much harm to baby therefore we are so much worried about it now uh, co uh, uh congenital uh, infections usually they are again asymptomatic and as if mother gets primary infection then risk what which uh, uh, overall damage uh, can occur to baby is 25 percent fine so that means if primary infection of cmv is occurring to 100 women during pregnancy so only 25 babies will be sh uh, uh, showing symptoms of cmv so it is not all that everyone will have the, all these uh, uh, symptoms what we discussed okay so it's damage to fetus because of primary infection it occurs only uh, only in the 25 percent of the um, babies fine so this i have already told you that only 10 percent of this 25 percent will have clinical symptom at birth okay the, those who have clinical <laughs> symptoms at birth so they will be examined by pediatrician and all sorts of tests will be done but 10 to 15 percent will go asymptomatic later on in life they will uh, they will come back to the hospital with long-term sequelae such as sensory neural deafness okay so all these things can happen so the these three percentages uh you know it may come in the exam so you have to remember so 25 percent is the, uh, uh, the overall risk of damage out of which 10 per 10 percent of the baby will show symptoms when they are born and 10 to fit rest 10 to 15 they will be asymptomatic they will show symptom as they grow up okay now uh you will get question about ultrasound features also okay and this is uh, also a uh, part three station also ecogenic bowel fine therefore i have put a picture of this and for part two people you can get question from any from uh, anywhere from here top uh, from this list okay they can give you some uh, features so you have to identify okay this is cmv usually uh not uh, uh, ultras uh, ultrasound is a non-invasive so it can be done uh, to find out how much the baby is effective but it has got poor sensitivity only it will be able to identify one third of infected fetus okay 
so that means two third of the babies will go unnoticed uh, if the uh, sonography is done fine so this part is important to remember because sometimes your role player will say okay my baby scan is well so um, uh, uh, that is a sort of a assurance to me so you have to say no because two third of the impacted babies they are not identified uh, on the ultrasound okay consideration for mri can be done because it will further increase sensitivity so these are the markers okay there could be ascites there could be cerebral ventriculomegaly ecogenic fetal bowel so i have put a picture of uh, ecogenic bowel okay so that maybe you will remember it as a like visual impression fgr can be there liver spleen can be enlarged there could be hydrops there could be microcephaly there there could be periventricular calcification in pseudocyst or pleural uh, pleural effusion all this hydrops and effusions are coming because there uh, uh, it is involving uh, liver and spleen um, so because of anemia all these issues will come up but this will come up late usually you will find questions what i have seen questions so uh, they will either give you a cites they will give you an uh, ecogenic fetal bowel they can give you fgr and also um, what i have seen is uh, microcephaly and periventral calcification so this much minimum usg uh, features or cmb you have to remember because you may get question from here and for part 3 people ecogenic bowel is a, a role player station so they have to know um the uh, um, one differential diagnosis for cmv as well now why we are so much worried about it because uh, you know we, uh, we have we have to know whether uh, if the patient is affected during pregnancy whether uh, it, this is a primary infection or this is a secondary infection if it is a primary infection then we would be worried because you know we already know in primary infection 25% of the babies will be affected okay but if it is a secondary infection we would not that much be worried because mother will be immune to it okay so now these things a bit a little bit um, complex but you know you need to understand so usually how the uh, in uh, what type of investigation can be done for the diagnosis of um, mother's infection so it is done uh um serology okay i one is serology and second one is avidity now first we speak about serology in serology there are two types of antibodies we do this will this would be uh, cmb igm or second will be cmb igg so uh, whenever you get an uh, uh, result so you will get two types of antibody and bodies and everybody knows what is the significance of it but where is the confusion so uh, uh, read a little bit theory about it so usually this igm uh, it if we are getting igm so every uh, every time we'll think okay there could be an active infection usually if the patient is infected so igm will appear within two weeks but it may persist for 3 to 4 months after a infection okay and in some of the patient at a very low level it may appear it may be there for many years because of all this situation and also it do have false positive rate so if we do one test for the patient and if the igm is positive so you know we are not in a position to give her any kind of diagnosis so uh, ideally we have to do two test okay because this igm it is if it is present for very long interval of time for low levels so we won't be able to explain this to the patient whether uh, you are infected right now or whether it had been a old infection therefore the problem occurs with this C, uh, cmb igm okay this is one point second point move to cmb igg usually uh, um, if igg appears so we are very happy because body started working for it usually it starts within 2 to 3 day, weeks after primary infection and it gives a lifelong immunity fine 
therefore we are not very much worried about a secondary infection because patient will have already uh, antibodies um, uh, already will be there in her blood fine so now usually uh, um, uh, whether it is a primary infection or whether it is a secondary infection if it is a primary infection and you are taking two tests in first test it will be IgM will be positive and IgG will be negative because body uh, patient has just have any infection but if you take second sample and in that second sample if you find now IgG has also come or uh, appeared now that means seroconversion had happened so if you find seroconversion in a patient that means you are dealing a patient of an uh, active infection or a new infection or a primary infection so this would be a matter of concern okay so if uh, any patient is getting several converted during pregnancy so patient is um, actively infective and patient is having uh, this active infection fine so this way we can diagnose active infection but sometime what will happen um, if the patient is uh, um, is showing reinfection in that situation and if you take two tests so in first test there will be igg because patient is already immune but because of reinfection in second sample you will find that there had been four times rise in the value of this igg so if you find two samples and the uh, uh, igg has been increased by four times in second sample so you are dealing with a reinfection so this way you can diagnose whether you are dealing with an active infection or whether you are dealing with a old infection so uh, this serology um, usually helps in uh, diagnosis so if it is a primary infection you will take all the care of referral to fetal medicine unit and all um, uh, like the serial uh, uh, sonographic uh, uh, surveillance but if it is an old infection or it is in a reinfection then you would just reassure to the woman okay so therefore it is important to find whether it is a primary infection or a secondary infection now uh, why this igm uh, persists for longer interval of time because uh, it, it do have a uh, um, because of the, uh, uh, it do have a cross reactivity for other viral infection and it may be detected as a result of non-specific poly uh, polyclonal stimulation of immune system need not to get confused with this uh, this is just an explanation that c uh, ig uh, m uh, may persist at low level for many years okay so this isn't just an example uh, explanation to this but it is not of any importance you have to just remember that it can uh, in low level it can present for very long interval of time okay now the problem occurs that uh, you have done one test and in that test igg and igm is positive or uh, you have done another test in both tests igg is positive and igm is positive now uh, uh, and you do not have any uh, previous sample of the patient to find out whether previously igg was negative or not so there occurs a confusion because this because of this issue okay so if you are doing two tests in both of the tests um, this igm is positive or igg is positive now you would be confused what to do now how to know whether it is a recent infection or whether it is an old infection so to solve that problem here comes the avidity okay so what is the avidity so avidity indicates the strength with which um, antibody will bind with this uh, uh, multivalent antigen okay so during first week you know igg will be less so there will be low binding of antibody so uh, igg uh, in primary infection because of less or uh, igg antibody so there will be uh, the, uh, the, uh, there will be low avidity so if you find avidity low less than 30% so 
so that means you are dealing with a primary infection or a recent infection that has been less than three months okay so avidity index less than 30 percent that means you are dealing with a new infection now if you find an avidity and avidity is more than 60 to 65 percent then you are dealing with a secondary infection okay so if there is a confusion because of the prolonged presence of these IgG and IgM antibodies and you are not able to find out whether you are dealing with a primary or secondary infection, in that particular situation, you will check avidity and avidity, the, um, the lab will give you a value. If it is less than 30, then you are dealing with a primary infection. So you will be worried. And if you are getting high avidity, so you would be kind of uh, uh, be relaxed. Okay, you are dealing with an old infection or uh, like no need to worry because it is an old infection or it is a secondary infection. And this test, uh, FDTT test, it do have a um, like sensitivity of 90 to 100% and specificity of 80 to 200%. Fine, where, so where this FDTT will help when you know you are not able to identify whether you are dealing with a primary infection or the uh, secondary infection and uh, you do not have any the sample previous sample uh, of blood um, to, uh, of the patient so you are confused and you have to decide so whether you are dealing with primary or secondary infection then that help is done by your avidity so uh, uh, is the is the, uh, the uh, diagnosis thing clear ma'am so everything is done everything is done only for igg not for igm yes it is uh, ig uh, so you can it is uh, from the definition you can find out avidity index expresses percentages of igg bound to an integer okay so now you it is very clear from the definition Okay, so if in the yeah, if in the question there is only IgM and there is no IgG, then also it indicates a primary infection only. But if both are there, IgG and IgM, then the severity we use to make out uh, like which is uh, primary or secondary. Correct, ma'am? Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Again, the uh, uh, this uh, when you uh, what will be the serological diagnosis for primary infection so there will be two things number one is seroconversion what is the seroconversion that you have taken two sample in first sample igg was negative and igm was positive so you took another sample and in second sample now your body has started producing igg so now igg has come so this newly developed igg <laughs> If it is there, then that situation we called as a seroconversion. So if in the pregnancy you are able to see seroconversion, you are sure you are dealing with primary infection. So this is one kind of situation. Second kind of situation, when you have taken two samples and in both samples, this IgM and IgG both are present. Now you are confused what to do. Then in that particular situation, you will do uh, FDT test. And if you find that IgM antibody is there and there is low avidity, low avidity less than 30%, then you are sure of that, uh, that patient has got primary infection. So in your question, part two or part three people, if you find seroconversion or you find IgM antibody plus low avidity. So these are the two situations that will give you the diagnosis of primary CMV infection and you have to think of uh, like giving or uh, doing management of this patient as a primary CMV infection. So there, there will be the two situation that yeah. you know that you're dealing with the primary infection. Uh, ma'am, yes. uh, ma'am, in the previous slide, uh, it says that uh, uh, the first week following primary infection, IgG is low, but slowly it progresses yes. moderately, moderately to the high level. But yes. uh, can we do the avidity test like uh, 12 to 16 weeks after infection? Then the avidity will be high, you know, ma'am. 
Yes, in that situation, avidity will be high. So if your avidity is high, that means you are dealing with a secondary infection. Even in the primary infection, the IgG slowly increases after 12 to 16 yeah. weeks of infection. So if See, we are uh, detecting okay. avidity in that time, so it can suggest of secondary infections. It can be misleading. Um, no, it can because, be misleading. Yeah. Uh, this CMV infection usually causes problem in first 16 weeks of pregnancy. Okay, sorry, first 14 weeks of pregnancy. So if your patient is coming within this time, in that situation, if you find avidity less than 30, so there will be possibility that she had active infection in last 12 weeks. Okay. So usually this avidity gives you a knowledge whether new infection had happened in last three months. So we are worried about this period only. Are you getting? So we so do it. Yes, ma'am. We are doing it early. So we are not waiting till that uh, 12 to 16 weeks after infection. Okay. After that, like if uh, if patient has infection in second trimester, okay, she is having in second trimester rate of transmission of virus will be 80 percent okay it will be 80 percent but a patient will have like uh, because the development is already there so patient will have very less uh, problem only what can happen at that time only igr will happen so you have to just do serial scans that way so main problem we have to identify what had happened in first 14 weeks of pregnancy where the major organogenesis is taking place, where all these issues can come up. Now, is yes. the thing clear? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, so it is important to understand this avidity thing. And this, please don't want to remember anything. Just remember these two things. If you find there had been a seroconversion, that means sample number one, Ig. M positive but G negative. Second sample, Ig G has appeared. That means your body has produced new IgG. So this is a definition of seroconversion. So if you find in your question seroconversion, you are dealing with primary infection. This would be scenario number two. Second number scenario, you would find Ig M positive with low avidity that also you are dealing with primary infection. So if you could remember only these things, you'll be able to solve it. Is here a question with regard to that? All of you move yourself. Uh, okay, so uh, so for CMB, we you somebody Please, all of you mute yourself. I can't, I, I don't know who is unmuted. Please mute yourself. Okay, so this is about the maternal uh, diagnosis of uh, from the maternal blood from the serology. What you will do? Okay, so now uh, you have. We are worried about the. So if the mother diagnosis, primary diagnosis is confirmed, now you, we want to know the diagnosis of fetus CMV. So what could be the test done for the fetus? Okay, so one like surveillance or monitoring we can do with the ultrasonographic scan or MRI, but that is again not confirmatory. If confirmatory test you want to do, it has to be with immunosynthesis. And immunosynthesis usually... Uh, it cannot be done early so you have it could be done after 20 weeks of pregnancy because that time that much uh, like fetal genital urine system uh, will produce that much of a urine and that much of a virus will be present from the urine of baby into the am amniotic fluid okay so according to the talk usually aminosynthesis has to be done 7 weeks after the maternal infection you can get question from here okay now, if they are doing taking uh, aminosynthesis, uh, they have to diagnose whether the virus is there or not. So these kind of tests they will do on the aminotic fluid. So they will check for CMV DNA by PCR 
or they will do uh, CMV detection of uh, anti fluorescent foci. Okay, so this I have not seen in many of questions, but at least you have to know that fetal diagnosis can be done. Uh, confirmatory fetal diagnosis can be done. Immunosynthesis. Immunosynthesis has to be done after seven weeks of presumed maternal infection. And what, you, what the testing will be done? Testing will be done for CMV DNA by PCR. So this way, confirm diagnosis of a fetal infection, a CMV infection would be done. But this hardly they ask in the exam. Okay. Now uh, uh, these days. There is no treatment for uh, CMV infect, congenital CMV infection. Okay, so uh, uh, there are certain studies are there, about uh, and certain trials are there about uh, this hyperimmunoglobulin and certain antiviral drugs. But as of now, uh, there had been no such kind of evidence to prove that they have been useful. Okay, so according to strategy, according to that talk. Uh, actually, there is no currently acceptable treatment method as present. Okay, so this part you have to know. Please don't get confused with this antivirals and immunoglobulin. They are just uh, they are under research. They are just trial only. Fine. So um, now, if your so what you will do if you have found that mother maternal infection uh, has been you have confirmed maternal primary infection, then what can be done? For the baby, three to four weekly USG scan can be done for a growth and particular extension to a head circumference. Why? Because this could be the one of the reason for microcephaly. Fine. Consideration for and these scan usually will be done where at the fetal medicine uh, unit people, and if they think like they want some more uh, adjunct to diagnosis. Consideration for fetal MRI can be done. Okay, so according, so they they will be able to identify it more much better on the MRI as compared to ultrasound because ultrasound ha do have a less sensitivity. Then uh, according to that, consider the, uh, uh, this cranial lesion whatever they find, so they will be able uh, to counsel the patient whether they should if the baby is severely affected. Whether the, uh, they want to continue with the pregnancy or they want to end the pregnancy. Okay, so they can give them the uh, idea about the counseling. And if the pregnancy continues, then following delivery, baby would go through a thorough neonatal assessment, developmental milestones, and including hearing. And usually, if for hearing test, you know, the long, long term. Usually four to five years, uh, these children they are kept under scrutiny. Fine. So these way, if a patient has CMV, so this will be the management part that can come because uh, there is no acceptable treatment for CMV. Now this is uh, the Hello, uh, this is picture. Hello, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Is yes, there yes. any special age limitation, ma'am? If, uh, if the women uh, can can because infection after uh, second trimester, sorry, after first trimester. That is, you told that the up to 14 weeks it is severe. After that, only IUGR. No, so we need to do amniocentesis for all. See, uh, aminos, uh, uh, please ask your question again, ma'am. If the women acquire infection after uh, first trimester, that is, after 14 weeks. Chances of mm -hmm. uh, anomalies is less. Yes. And only IUGR. So yes. we need to do amniocentesis after 14 weeks also or not. Okay. So that again, whether this patient baby is affected or not, whether amniocentesis is required or not, that we are not uh, the people to decide. Usually, if maternal primary infection is confirmed by gynae people or obstetrician, then this patient would be referred to uh, FMU or fetal medicine unit. So, fetal medicine unit people they will do all kind of counseling, and uh, if they do have a suspicion on scan, or or then they will counsel them for um, amniocentesis. Okay, 
so we are not there to you know decide anything it will be by the fmu people only so according to the uh, uh, if, if they ask about uh, in uh, sba they will give option like serial ultra uh, serial scan and one more option is amniocentesis uh, we need to go for amniocentesis no okay you have to give me a question first <laughs> So, okay ma'am <laughs> sorry ma'am actually if if the mother if the mother acquires infection by uh, nearly 16 to 18 weeks like that mm -hmm. that time we need to do amniocentesis for her or we'll do only serial scan okay they, they would go give something more in the picture okay only with this much i think like uh, giving answer will be difficult so uh, if they were uh, If, if they will give you something on the ultrasound scan then you will send referral to uh, fmu okay and if they, uh, they will give you in the answer she want to know the confirmed diagnosis then answer will be amniocentesis okay so the, some you know you have to give complete question otherwise it would be difficult how uh, what you want to actually know you know but th Dr. this Priyata. way uh, yeah in this uh, in the same slide uh, it is written that uh, uh, like if fetal infection uh, uh, you have to detect is amniocentesis 7 weeks after presume infection and if uh, pregnancy is more than 21 weeks it should be done by ultrasound screening serial scans this is the meaning of that after 21 weeks you will do ultrasound and before 21 weeks uh, you will do uh, amniocentesis because the the proper age for amniocentesis is between 15 to 20 weeks no 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 amniocentesis does okay. it mean by uh, that amino if the maternal infection no no so um, maternal infection whenever you have confirmed infection okay if you have confirmed infection like today so if and you patient want to know whether it is confirmed or not, um, fetal infection or not so you will send to this patient uh, for amino synthesis 7 weeks after maternal infection why it is there because from mother some infection will go to baby then baby has to uh, produce that much amount of urine so that it uh, that much of virus has to come in uh, amino uh, on amniotic fluid then only by doing amino synthesis you will be able to uh, find out whether the baby is affected or not if it is done And like this is regardless less of this is regardless yeah. of gestation age at any like any first uh, in first trimester or second trimester or third trimester regardless of the gestational age we are doing yeah, this after 7 weeks yeah, yeah it it will be regardless of age because that much time baby will uh, take uh, uh, virus will take uh, to come in amniotic if you uh, according to this tog and you know if it is done less than that time so in that situation it will not come it will not appear in amino uh, amniotic fluid so what will be the use why you will put this patient to invasive thing okay is it clear yes. okay and i will, I will show one and more this after also. 21 weeks of gestation in this return it is after 21 weeks of gestation okay so now if you uh, you have got a infection at uh, uh, you know maybe at uh, 11 weeks so um, if it, uh, and 11 plus 7 will be 18 weeks so what they want or like uh, like you can send that uh, for amino synthesis after 21 weeks like after 18 we uh, weeks you can send but the patient has to have a 21 weeks minimum 21 weeks Though amino synthesis can be done from anywhere between 15 to 20 weeks, fine. But uh, uh, like uh, if if the early infection is there, and plus seven weeks, it is less than uh, less than 15 weeks. In that situation, you can't send that patient for uh, amino synthesis because that much amount of amniotic fluid will not be there. So usually, basically, they are giving you two type of things. So after maternal infection. if uh, you have to send this patient for uh, amino synthesis it has to be at least minimum 7 uh, weeks time or uh, it has to be minimum 20 to 21 weeks so that if amino synthesis is done that at least that much amniotic fluid will be there so it will come out 
so if it is done less than that time so there could be possibility if it is less than 7 weeks time there could be possibility you will not get anything on uh, like fetal in uh, the virus pcr dna will come negative okay because that much time is not there and if you do immunosynthesis at a lesser um, gestational age maybe possibility it will be a dry trap you will not get that much amount of fluid okay because it will take some of the time baby will be affected and baby uh, then virus will come out in baby's urine and with that urine that amniotic fluid uh, uh, will be there in uh, urine will be there in the amniotic fluid so it will be take at least this minimum 7 weeks of time the after that only it will it will show in the amniotic fluid is the thing clear ma'am it means that it can be done at any age of gestation ma'am amniosynthesis yes ma'am yes it is done at the third trimester also okay ma'am okay okay it got it clear ma'am okay yeah it it should not be done before 20 or 21 but later on it can be done that you have okay. to give all the, you have to explain the patient all the risk of preterm labor and all that is there in immunosynthesis guideline also okay so this is uh, this uh, uh, picture is from that sip that uh, sip uh, that has come for this uh, cmv so the things will be like more much more clear in that so if the confirmed fetal infection by uh, aminosynthesis now they have done aminosynthesis aminosynthesis is a uh, previous talk said that we have to do after 7 weeks but this sip said it can be done after 6 to 8 weeks fine so you can so if, if you can remember this 6 to 8 weeks then it is already that 7 week window is coming okay and for aminosynthesis it has to be more than 20 weeks okay less than that that much amniotic fluid is not there so if confirmed a fetal infection is there so what could be the done so either uh, ultrasonographic serial uh, uh, usg surveillance can be done every 2 to 4 weeks consideration for plus and minus fetal mri at 28 to 32 weeks of pregnancy or consideration for fetal blood sampling all these are plus and minus okay so this this can be done now if baby has got nothing baby is asymptomatic so uh, conservative treatment will done until til delivery once the baby is born baby is clinical uh, uh, or um, like auditory function um, eye testing laboratory testing imaging complete assessment of neonate will be done and po uh, and if some infection is there then post natal treatment of the baby will be done with a long term follow up and consideration they have to they will do placental examination always now uh, two types of uh, uh, situation other type of situation if the baby is mild to moderate infected so consider uh, two type of things can be done either uh, 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 she, she, they can continue with the pregnancy and you will do all this thing for the baby and you can also give option of termination of the pregnancy fine and if the baby is severe severely um, symptomatic or affected then consideration for directly termination can be done and if the if uh, the patient has opted for termination of pregnancy then a uh, baby has to be sent for post mortem and also placental examination has to be done so this is the flow chart from this a uh, sip uh, 2070 cmv for the management of confirmed fetal infection so if you could remember this uh, like uh, this picture then the things will be easy if any question about cmv uh, treatment for confirmed fetus comes is it clear ma'am so if uh, mother is positive but fetus amniocentesis is not showing cmv then do we do this all this or we we don't do it okay if so you are going to this you are saying this time like asymptomatic fetus so this will be no, the management no, no. plan no no not no, like ma'am. asymptomatic the I'm baby has not acquired it at all like in amniocentesis it has come negative but mother is confirmed oh. positive Vert- vertical transmission is not 100% no? so like if baby is not affected then do we still follow this uh, detailed ultrasound every 2 to 4 weeks and plus or minus mri is what i'm asking ma'am this flow chart is for uh, confirmed fetal infection 
Yeah, this is for confirmed fetal infection. Okay, baby is not affected. If the baby is not infected in that situation, uh, uh, you can assure this woman. Okay, but uh, mm -hmm. again, that patient would be in high risk. So once the baby will be born, born all this test or all examination will be done for baby. Maybe they will not do that much ultrasound examination. But once the baby is there, so this much part will be still done. Okay, so only after the birth, we don't do antenatal surveillance for uh, that antenatal, baby. Yeah, if the fetal infection is not there, so why you will do that? Okay. Okay. Okay, so these are the CMV numbers. So all from uh, all number of this, I have seen questions. So you have to remember this. So incidence 0.5 to 2%. Transmission in first and second trans, uh, trimester is 40%. In third trimester, it increases to 80%. So just remember this 40 and 80. Recurrent, it will be 1 to 2%. Sensi neural deafness will be 12%. Cerebral, cerebral palsy will be 8%. Overall fetal damage will be 25%. Babies with the symptoms at birth will be 10%. Asymptomatic baby will be 10 to 15%. So uh, like with um, with all these five, uh, six uh, numbers that I have put in the first, uh, this thing, I have seen question from every number of it. So you have to remember these numbers okay incubation period for cmv okay i, I think I, I never put it i think i never put it previous slide you have put 70 to 95 percent will be asymptomatic actually like before this before this where the percentages are there before This 10 to 15 percent is those who will have uh, symptoms later. That is what. Yeah, yeah, mean. yeah, yeah. This slide. So asymptomatic will be 90 percent, but uh, 10 percent will be symptomatic be at birth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 10 to 15 will be later. So total okay. asymptomatic is 90. Okay. So this. Okay. So uh, let me tell you. So this this much babies they will be asymptomatic. This is a different percentage. Okay. Now come to this percentage. How many baby will be getting damaged? So this damaged baby will be 25%. And out of this 25%, who are at the risk of damage? 10% baby will show symptom at birth, and 10 to 15% will show symptom of damage. When the baby will grow up, they will show all the symptoms of CNS involvement. Is the thing clear now? Yes, ma'am. So that's all about CMV. So I try to cover both talks and, and sip of CMV. So any question with CMV or should we move to Parvo? Clear, ma'am. Clear. Now uh, CMV is, yeah, you have to do it really well because CMV is a hub of questions, you know. Now coming to Parvo, Parvo is easy and uh, not that difficult so parvo virus uh, it is a dna virus and it do have a like a more uh, it affects the rapidly dividing red blood cells okay so it affects rapidly dividing cells so in your in the body there should be rapidly where uh, are the rapidly divided cells they will be affected okay so a route of transmission is respiratory respiratory droplets. This you have to remember because it is asked in the exam. Now 50% uh, of the women in UK, they will be uh, um, uh, immune. Okay, already they might have got infection sometime and 50% will be susceptible to infection. Now parvovirus, uh, um, like it is called, uh, uh, it um, sometimes the infection may be subclinical. It present as erythema infectiosum or fifth disease. So what can happen? There could be uh, fever, arthralgia, and malaise. Usually these could be the symptoms. Um, like any viral infection will give you this kind of symptom. 
and it is called as erythema uh, infectiosum and also it is called as a fifth disease so you have to know the all this uh, like buzzword because sometime you know they will not write parvovirus they will write this uh, these names only and why it is called as a fifth disease this i, uh, I just read about it so in in the history you know when they were right they, they wrote the disease that causes rashes or something so it, it parvovirus in detection it was fifth in number therefore it is called as a fifth disease fine usually baby will have a typical rash and a slap cheek appearance it affects the baby and because it affects the uh, con if the congenital infection occurs usually it affects rapidly dividing red blood cells so there could be possibility of hemolytic anemia high drops and intrauterine death okay now uh, the incubation period is important i have made a separate slide for incubation period that will come at the end so incubation period for parvo is for 4 to 21 days okay there is a separate slide you will see every incubation period there also and now this is important this line is important to remember so patient is infectious 10 days uh, post exposure and until the rash appears so that means when the patient will come to you patient usually comes to you when patient has rash and that moment of time she has automatically by itself become less non-infectious to all other children or the woman okay so it is important to know how uh, that when the patient was infectious because uh, if the patient is infectious we usually cause them avoid contact with the young children and the pregnant mother so this is a period of infectivity 10 days post exposure to appearance of the rash okay so this is a period of infectivity this you have to remember usually symptom will come about uh, 10th day rash may appear about 18th day after exposure this number is not important never they have asked in the exam there could be fever headache nausea uh, uh, arthralgia diarrhea all these non-specific symptoms occur okay as the fever breaks red rash appear on the cheek okay and with the relative pallor around the mouth and this is called as a slap cheek rash it spares nasolabial fold forehead and mouth okay now i will show you picture so this is a slap cheek appearance and it is a rash for parvovirus so that you have to remember so it is a red rash around the cheek with uh, with pallor around the mouth okay so uh, around the mouth and about uh, around nasolabial folds um, there is nothing only this is appear uh, effect, uh, happens and this is slab cheek appearance or ra typical rash of parvovirus now what happens in the uh, uh, later on so first it appears on the cheek then it uh, uh, like spreads to trunk or extremities then it appear uh, when it uh, spreads so there is a pattern that is called as a reticular or lace like pattern so now you see so now you can see this picture so this is a, a lay um, uh, reticular pattern or this is a lace like pattern so this is a fifth disease and this is a lacy rash why i have put this picture because when I appeared in part two exam, so I had an EMQ where they have only give a one buzzword that was a lacy rash. And at that time, I never knew it was a parvo virus because I read everything from by parvo, but this lacy rash, it was not given in any talk. So I never knew it, but in the exam I was did a guess work i was able to correct do correct uh, correct answer put correct answer so i have put picture because it may come any time in the exam lacy rash it you are dealing with parvovirus so this is a kind of buzzword maybe you can get in your exam just you are having okay so uh, yeah so uh, this can happen so th all these are features of parvo so you have to remember some buzzword it is the uh, uh, fifth disease infection uh, 
erythema infectiosum, uh, slab cheek appearance or slab cheek rash or reticular or lace like rash or lacy rash. All these are the buzzword that will take you answer of parvovirus. Now this picture I have already shown you. Now nobody will do any mistake. Those who are attending class, they will put their answer right. Now this, they, uh, they, uh, this is a very frequent question you will find. Uh, Transplacental transmi uh, transmission of parvo. So you have to, you know, these numbers are difficult to remember, but there is no, uh, you know, short term. So it is 15% 15, 15, uh, 15 before 15 weeks. Then it increases to 25% in 15 to 20 weeks and after uh, towards that time it is 70%. So just remember this parvo by 15, 25 and 70. Same number you will find in the exam. You have to remember this. So I have, uh, when I, uh, I will give you a sum up slide. In sum up slide, you will, uh, I have put this number again. You know, so the revision before the exam will be easy. Now, what can happen with this parvo? Why we are worried about parvo? So the all these things can happen in the parvo. So there could be miscarriage. So th this is one kind of infection that can cause miscarriage. There could uh, uh, we already know it can cause anemia because it affects red blood cell. It it is the reason for non-immune high drops. You have to remember this non-immune. Then it can cause baby to die. Uh, but you know you will find this from question from here no evidence of teratogenesis that means it will not cause any congenital anomaly okay so this is only one virus in viral infection that will not uh, that is will not cause any problem with the development or there will be no uh, uh, teratogenesis because of this virus okay all other viruses cause this teratogenetic problem but only parvo does not do that kind of problem. Okay, so this one number is important. Before 20 weeks, rate of fetal loss is 9%. Rate of high drops is 3%. And uh, uh, so these numbers are important to uh, know. And uh, what usually happens, uh, it, uh, the baby is usually affected five weeks after maternal infection. And uh, a, a spontaneous resolution can also happen. All the babies will not require treatment. It usually happens one to seven weeks after diagnosis. Rate of uh, fetal death is 10%. And de death occurs usually four to six following maternal symptom. Okay, so this is the time. So what you have to, so these, this can be done with the, with the parvovirus. Number you have to remember is 9% fetal loss, 3% high drops, 10% rate of death, fetal death, the IgGM uh, positive. And here you can see a picture that is giving, that is showing, you know, uh, this is usually showing so much of fluid inside the abdomen of the baby. So these are, this is giving a picture of high drops. Now, again, the problem occurs with the diagnosis. So, a diagnosis for uh, uh, maternal infection, then a diagnosis of fetal infection. So, maternal infection, like if we, uh, there could be two diagnosis, two things we can take in diagnosis. So, we can do serology. So, for any kind of serology, to find out whether seroconversion had happened or not, we have to take two samples, okay? So, uh, what uh, usually in the UK, uh, whenever this pregnant woman they are coming for booking visit so they take uh, um, for all antenatal profile they uh, uh, they take a sample and usually they that sample is preserved okay so they never destroy that sample so if any kind of infection occurs so uh, they can do test from that previous sample also so if in the previous sample like in booking sample uh, they find that IgG was negative. Now they have tested for parvo and IgM has also come and IgG also come. That means there had been a sandro conversion. You have taken two tests and in those two tests, IgG from negative 
uh, has come positive. So this is sero seroconversion. So if you find seroconversion, you are dealing with a primary infection. Fine. And uh, if there had been any kind of config, uh, uh, like uh, any kind of uh, uh, confusion is there, you have a patient does not give any history of rash. Patient does not uh, IgM is negative. Uh, and you are not able to find uh, seroconversion. So these are the situation, you know, uh, and there is no previous sample available. So in that situation, you are stuck now. You have got a suspicion there could be possibility of pyrovirus, but you're not able to find out from, uh, from the history of patient, from blood test of the patient, then you have to go, uh, uh, you have to go for another test that will be PCR, okay? parvovirus DNA by PCR. So now this is uh, in congenital infection. This parvovirus infection is only one infection where they, uh, 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 if there is any confusion, confu a test is done by uh, uh, checking DNA PCR in other infections, congenital infection, they usually do AVDT test, okay? So in parvo infection, there is uh, con uh, if any confusion uh, uh, like they will do dna uh, pcr for the confirmation of diagnosis so this is about maternal this is about maternal parvovirus infection uh, like how you will do the serology and also it provides you lifelong immunity okay parvovirus gives lifelong immunity to the patient so and uh, um, uh, uh, this IgM is very short-lived in case of parvovirus. Only it will be present within first four weeks. Okay, if the patient has a history of infection and she comes to you and uh, it is the like um, five weeks she's coming to you and you if you take sample for IgM, it will come negative. Okay, you will not be able to detect that in the sample because it is a short-lived IgM. It will appear less than four weeks. Fine. Now this part is important to remember. I will send you uh, um, like I will send you. This is from the Public Health England uh, document. I will send that document in the group so you'll be able to see that. And uh, it is important because you will find question from here. Okay. So now uh, uh, just to understand this. So if a patient, a patient has got a rash um, and you have got a confusion that you have a suspicion of parvo, okay? So what you will do? So you have con uh, confusion, uh, you have suspicion for parvo B19. So you will uh, arrange test for uh, I serology. Serology will be IgG and IgM. Now these three things will happen. So if you do this kind of test, patient if the patient's igm negative and igg positive then what you will do you will send this patient home, go, uh, home back you uh, patient is not at a risk of infection okay now there will be second situation now igm has come positive so if the igm has come positive in that situation you will always have a, a, a suspicion in the head okay i'm dealing with active infection then to find out seroconversion you have to uh, it can be done from the two sample so either you will check from the booking blood whether the seroconversion had happened or not or if the booking blood is not there then consider you will send second sample also otherwise you can send another sample because to detect seroconversion you would require two samples okay so now this uh, this uh, this is the uh, this I'm explaining. So if IgM is detected, so send the sample for confirmatory testing. Obtain further uh, sample again. So there because you would require two sample. Okay. Now there is will be third kind of situation where your both uh, IgM and IgG has come negative. If both are negative and you had a suspicion, so what you will do? you would rearrange test after one month okay so according to then whatever the result will come accordingly you will counsel this situation so this uh, if you can understand this then the interpretation for any kind of question for parvo will be easy for you 
Now, is the thing clear? Any question? With this, any question? Any question? Clear, ma'am. Now, uh, maternal parvovirus has been confirmed. You are able to make diagnosis. You have to do something. So, uh, serial USG has to be done with MCA PCV. Why? Because you want to detect fetal anemia. Usually, this ultrasound scanning uh, will be started four weeks after uh, um, onset of illness of uh, disease. It has to be done one to two weekly at least for 12 weeks okay so you have to do uh, arrange it at least for 12 weeks why we are doing it because we want to identify anemia ascites hydrox so that accordingly treatment can be taken now this uh this i have already told you that in infected fet uh, the fetus hydrops fetal hydrops uh, secondary to it can happen but in one third of the cases, you know, there will be no IUT or intrauterine transfusion will be required. One third of the cases will recover by itself. But in another uh, two third of the cases, they will do monitoring. And if they any time they find NCA PCV more than 1.5 MOM, then there is a possibility of fetal anemia. Then consideration for uh, um, like they will do that uh, um, the fetal blood sampling or they will consider intrauterine blood transfusion, okay? Then uh, what they are saying that uh, hydrops with parvo 19B19 infection, 94% of that then will be resolved uh, within uh, six weeks of in, uh, IUT or intrauterine blood transfusion. Okay, so this number also I have seen in the exam, how much percentages uh, of uh, fetal this thing hydrops can be uh, treat uh, can be uh, will be resolved with the iut so your answer will be uh, 94 percent now this is again uh, um, though we have discussed that but it, this is a management flow flow chart for parvo if you have got a confirmed b uh, parvo infection so ultrasound uh, will be done usually after four weeks of illness. Then if uh, uh, any suggestion of hydrops is there, you have to refer this patient to uh, FMU, okay? But if uh, uh, ultra, on ultrasonography there had been no issue, then repeated scan will be done at one to two weeks interval. Any time if you find hydrops, refer to FMU, but if there is no high drops or no nothing is there, so at least uh, till uh, 30 weeks of gestation, you have to follow this patient. And at the 30 weeks, if you find that a baby is doing well in that situation, uh, you can now reassure the patient and you, you can send that patient back. This, uh, this flow chart is important to understand because I have seen many questions from parvovirus. So some, you know, if you understand this chart, you'll be able to answer all questions of parvovirus management. Is the, is the thing clear about this chart? Not difficult also. Any question? Any question? Clear. Clear, ma'am, clear. Okay. Okay, now come to rubella. Rubella again is a, a hot topic and uh, and it is again a hub of so many questions. So uh, incubation period for rubella is uh, 14 to 21 days. Okay, and women will be infectious seven days before rash and seven days after rash. How to remember this? You know, rubella is the most easy to remember. Every number will come from tab seven table. 7 in, uh, into 1, 7 into 2 is 14, and 7 into 3 is 21. Okay, so you have to just remember the 7 table, table of 7. So you'll, uh, you'll be able to remember rubella incubation is 14 to 21. Infectious period will be from 7 days before rash 
to seven days after rash fine now uh, what can um, we have just in the first slide we uh, we know uh, uh, just uh, read what the disease that can cause maculopapular rash so maculopapular rash will be can be caused by measles it can be caused by rubella or it can be caused by parvo okay parvo we have just read now it is rubella so this is the maculopapular rash of rubella all of us we have seen this even many of us we had measles okay in our child when we were child so we know we uh, we had this rash so if the maternal rubella is there so you sometime you know most of the time it will be asymptomatic otherwise a non specific symptom can happen so this could be malaise headache coryza lymphadenopathy or a diffuse fine maculopapular rash okay so this is the uh, this is you can see this kind of rash can happen now uh, this number this slide is very very important a uh, rate of vertical transmission from every line you will find question so you have to remember this numbers you know the, there is no other way before 12 weeks 90% so 90% baby will be infected from 12 to 14 16 weeks it is 55 after 16 weeks it is 45% okay I, I, in last sum up table i will give you all these numbers but uh, you have to remember this number you can't uh, uh, like you 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 have to mug it up because this will come in the exam same same numbers now uh, these this is the risk of transmission now what will be the risk of in, uh, congenital defects so congenital defect before 12 weeks it will be 90% okay so 12 before 12 weeks rubella very dangerous it uh, transmission rate and uh, congenital in uh, defect rate both is 90 that is very high number now a uh, congenital defect reduces to 20 in between 12 to 16 weeks and after 16 weeks you know it becomes a bit better only deafness can happen deafness usually uh, happen till 20 weeks it this every number is important to remember because if your patient is coming at 22 weeks of pregnancy and she had a rubella infection then you will just say she is not at risk of anything only transmission of virus can happen but baby risk of baby having congenitally defective is almost is very less okay so therefore this you have to remember or it usually comes in the exam reinfection can ha also happen in reinfection risk of the uh, of infection to baby is really less because of mo because mother is already immune fine so you have to remember this six lines of rubella now what the rubella can do rubella again it, it, it um, is a killer it can do all sort of things there could be hearing loss learning disability cardiac malformation okay so this heart problem it can occur with the rubella so uh, you, uh, sometime you know you will have a um, confusion whether you are dealing with cmv or you are dealing with a rubella this cardiac malformation will help you in diagnosis cardiac malformation usually occurs in rubella it does not occur in cmv so that will give you uh, a bit um, uh, helping your answer okay rest or the uh, other thing will happen with cmv also so it can affect cns there could be cataract iugr there could be hepatosplenomegaly jaundice purpura anemia but if the baby has born then some endocrinopathies can happen later in life or late onset deafness can happen or neurodevelopmental problem can happen okay so this you have to know because question comes from here also now this is a pictorial uh, presentation that will help you in diagnosis so it you now if you see it affects the baby's brain so if it is affecting baby's brain so microcephaly can happen and now it it can affect uh, if it if it is affecting brain so it can affect eyes also so ocular problem can happen so these are the ocular thing that can happen you know 
there, there could be cataracts, there could be uh, 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 micro ophthalmia. So, so many things can happen with the eye. So, eye can be affected. So, if brain is affected, ear has to be affected. So, ear problem can happen like hearing loss can happen. Okay, so this way you'll be able now brain is affected, eyes are affected and uh, ears are affected. Now, as it is affecting liver and spleen also, the, so problem with all uh, hepatosplenomegaly, patechia, purpura, anemia, all these things will also happen. Now, the differential uh, point, you will be able to differ make it differ uh, uh, differentiate it from CMV is this heart problem. Oh, heart problem usually occurs with rubella, okay? Heart problem does not occur with CMV. And what type of heart disease that is most common is the PDA. Okay, so this is the PDA. Usually rubella syndrome, it is a, I think it is a rubella triad. So there could be microcephaly, there could be PDA, and there is a congenital cataract. So this is a picture. This will help you in remembering. So how much damage a rubella can do? Now, again, the issue will come with the diagnosis. So diagnosis, it is uh, same as what we have done in CMV. So I, you uh, like uh, uh, if the seroconversion is there, uh, then uh, it is an active infection. Or if any confusion is there, then you will do uh, avidity test. If avidity is less than 30, you are dealing with recent infection. If it is more, you are dealing with old infection. So in CMV and in rubella, diagnosis of maternal infection is done with the seroconversion or it can be done if any confusion, you need to arrange for an AVDT testing. So uh, this is again a flow chart this, uh, um, for rubella. You know, so if any patient has a history of contact with the uh, rubella, so um, what you will do, you will arrange for serology. Now in the serology, uh, you will do IgM and IgG. If IgG is de detected, yes, then we are happy we, uh, uh, that there is no recent infection. We will ask this uh, patient to go back. But second situation, we are not able to find IgG, but uh, uh, we are able to find IgM. So if we are able to identify IgM, then we have to take uh, uh, either we will do for to detect seroconversion. We will check it, uh, compare it with the booking blood, or we will send another test because we, to find out seroconversion, we have to have a two test. Second situation, uh, IgM and IgG both are negative, and patient has a history of contact. So we had a suspicion in our head. So we will ask this woman to come back after one month we will do test again okay so th this is the same what we have done for the parvo as well now this is again same kind of picture what we uh, what we did for, for parvo so if any patient now this uh, if any patient uh, is coming and she is coming to you uh, with the complaints that she has an uh, contact uh, with a woman who had a rubella okay so in that situation, what you will do? First, you will take history, okay? So what history you will take? You will ask her whether she has taken rubella vaccine. If she gives you a documented history of two doses, or she gives you, she has taken one dose of rubella, um, anti, uh, rubella vaccine, and one test, uh, one, uh, any time one test has been done, where rubella antibody IgG was present. So this is the second situation. If, if th these two situation becomes yes, then a patient is not, uh, can be reassured. She is not at risk of rubella. In that particular situation, you will, uh, you will reassure her. You will ask her, go back home. If any time you develop rash, please come, uh, please contact GP, okay? So this is the one type of situation. Now, second type of situation, your patient has not taken any uh, vaccine and she has an exposure. So now your job becomes, you have, you have a suspicion of primary infection. So you will do this serology. 
serology again you will do igg and igm now if you have done these two testing if igm becomes negative and igg positive so in that situation again patient has to be reassured she is not at a risk of ref, uh, infection so she will go you will reassure her and you will ask her please go to gp if rash develops this part you have to understand well in your emq if there are two option one is reassure another option is re, uh, reassure and report to gp if rash develops so you you need to take second answer rather than reassure this is therefore emq becomes a tricky you have to check your all choices okay second situation where igm is positive whenever igm is positive we do have a suspicion okay we are dealing with the active infection now for active infection we have to find out sero conversion sero conversion either we will uh, uh, check it from the reference sample that means booking blood sample but if we do not have that sample then we would uh, send another uh, sample okay so we, we will request for second sample and uh, bo both of the sample then analysis will be done accordingly the test will come okay so uh, this is done and uh, uh, we will send both sample to uh, for the laboratory because if in both samples igm coming positive in a low level or there had been a confusion then they will do avidity testing fine last type situation when you have done test for the patient there is no igg there is no igm and this patient has a history of rash what you will do then you will say we have got suspicion please come back after one month time uh, we will do your test again if second time also her test becomes negative that means this patient is a susceptible for rubella so once her pregnancy is over you have to arrange for two doses of mmr injection to that patient so this slide is real important many questions will be solved from this slide is it clear yes ma'am is it clear people clear, clear. okay now uh, your uh, fetal infection is confirmed okay then uh, okay uh, how you will confirm the fetal infection again fetal infection can be confirmed only with the amniocentesis what type of testing will be done it will be uh, rt pcr okay for detector detection of virus nucleic acid fine so the rt pcr is done for the diagnosis of fetal infection but i have never seen any question from the, uh, how you will diagnose fetus fine now if the fetus has come positive so what you will do so in that particular situation so if the fetal uh, uh, if the like invasive testing has come positive for the virus please all of you mute yourself if all <laughs> okay so now uh, we have confirmed that this baby has a uh, uh, rubella now what you will do so uh, you will you will have to see uh, uh, gestational age so if, uh, according to the gestational age you will decide whether you will say uh, or give the option of termination or whether you will give uh, option of uh, ultrasound surveillance uh, to detect the con uh, congenital rubella syndrome okay so like if you are getting a patient less than 12 weeks of pregnancy and it is a recent infection so risk of transmission is 90 risk of baby's infection is again 90 percent the best option will be going giving for termination okay but if you are getting a patient who is more than uh, 20 weeks of pregnancy then in that situation kind of reassurance will be okay that patient has to be put under serial ultrasound surveillance to find a congenital rubella syndrome but you know uh, uh, but in this particular situation we have to arrange for fetal echocardiography also in addition to scan why because we already know that uh, uh, pda is there patent ductus arteriosus pda is one of the implication for uh, congenital rubella so you have to arrange for fetal echo as well now you have to reassure your uh, you explain to your patient that congenital rubella syndrome 
all things will not be detectable by the ultrasound so i i can tell you the number as well in 19% of the cases congenital problem rubella syndrome will not be identified or not be detectable on the ultrasound though that percentage is not important okay so th that's all about rubella anything you if you have to ask you can ask me any questions about rubella Uh, Ma'am, if patient received rubella vaccine and accidentally uh, the pregnancy is diagnosed after vaccination, so should we ask her to terminate? What you are saying? Should we ask her for termination? Termination of pregnancy? No, you uh, you have to just explain her everything, all the risk and benefit. She will decide. But uh, accidentally getting vaccine. I think is not an indication for termination, though live vaccines are contraindicated during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ma'am, is the termination of pregnancy only in the first trimester or for also second trimester, ma'am? Termination of pregnancy you will um, say in the first trimester, okay. In the second trimester, uh, like uh, though the risk of transmission is 55% and only 20% risk of congenital rubella syndrome is there. But if uh, on the ultrasound scan, so many problems has come, multiple problems has uh, um, the appears, then in that situation, maybe according to the situation, you can say for termination. But first trimester, definite termination. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, in parvovirus, okay, no. the, uh, I just wanted to ask, yes. in parvovirus, the confirmatory test will be PCR, no, ma'am? If any confusion is there. Yeah, otherwise, just IgG and IgM will be sufficient. Yeah, serology. Okay, thank you. Okay, so from the toxoplasma, sometimes uh, question do come. One. Ma'am, can I ask one question? Yes, yes. Uh, Ma'am, uh, in the rubella, that uh, zero conversion, avidity is uh, similar to CMV or uh, is there any difference from the uh, CMV same, when we same. do avidity test? Same, same. same, same. No, no change. Okay, okay Ma'am, thank you. Okay, so toxo, uh, uh, whatever we are doing uh, till now, they were viral infections. So toxoplasma is a parasitic infection. Okay, so though it is a very simple thing, you know, sometimes we mess up with this simple thing also. So it is a parasitic infection and how it uh, occurs by ingestion of uncooked meat uh, that carries infectious oocytes that is excreted by cats or they can be present in contaminated soil and water. Okay. So everybody knows this, nothing new in about it. Incidence of maternal infection is two in one thousand, two uh, per thousand pregnancies, but this number is not important because they have never asked in the exam. Now, primary infection in toxoplasma, it is asymptomatic in 60 to 70% of the cases. Only patient may have uh, malaise, fever, or lymphadenopathy. Okay, now this slide is important because you will get question from here. So fetal risk of transmission, uh, usually it increases with the gestational age. So less than four, this number is important, you know, it, they ask in the exam. Less than four weeks, it is 1% risk of transmission. At 13 weeks, it is 4 to 15. And at 36 weeks, it is 60%, okay. And a congen so uh, CV, uh, like, uh, rate of transmission increases with the gestational age, but the severity of disease, it decreases with the gestational uh, age. That means severe kind of disease will happen during the first trimester that we already know that severity will be more in first trimester because of the organogenesis that occurs in first trimester. Okay, so combined risk of primary infection is highest in the middle of pregnancy according to this uh, talk you know it is uh, 13 to 28 weeks you have to remember this number because you know you you may get question from here directly 
now uh, this is uh, so this is all about transmission now a uh, rate of congenital sequelae that can happen okay so in early pregnancy if uh, like in less than 12 weeks if infection occurs so 85% of the babies can be affected but in late it decreases okay this number i have never seen question just you see this number it is important to know uh, toxoplasma triad because this this question can be asked so what comes in toxoplasma triad is intercerebral calcification hydrocephalus and chorioretinitis so uh, you because they may give some another uh, choice along with it and you have to identify toxoplasma triad it is important to know now uh, what can happen just i said it affects congenital nervous system so problem with the uh, brain can happen microcephaly hydrocephalus ventricomegaly problem with the eye can happen it can cause chorioretinitis okay so this thing can happen and learning disability uh, uh, blindness can happen hepatomegaly anemia rash pneumonitis jaundice all this thing can happen okay with this so now you can see this it is not causing any ear problem okay now cmv and rubella they were causing both causing ear problem how you can differentiate between cmv and rubella that rubella causes heart problem and pda is characteristic of it and in congenital toxoplasmosis ear is not affected and heart is also not affected so this way you will be able to put in the answer because sometime uh, they appears quite near same now how you will diagnose diagnosis is again same you will uh, arrange for serology and in serology primary infection it will be uh, identification of sero conversion and if any uh, uh, any confusion is there then consideration for avidity so now, now you can understand cmv uh, rubella and toxoplasma these three are the congenital infection diagnosis is by the sero the serology primary infection can be uh, diagnosed with the sero conversion if any confusion do go for avidity so all uh, these three type of things if you you can remember so that uh, uh, you, uh, uh, answering questions will be easy for you look always look for sero conversion to detect primary infection now how the fetal diagnosis can be done it can be done via uh, amniocentesis where the amniotic uh, uh, like they can uh, detect a toxoplasma in uh, um, in uh, um, amniotic fluid or they can do chordocentesis to uh, find out whether fetal igm is there so but they never ask question about fetal diagnosis okay so what could be the uh, you know ultrasound feature ultrasound feature what i just said in triad it was a intracerebral calcification so you therefore i have put picture also now you will remember that intracerebral calcification occur here in the toxoplasma so it can cause all sort of things it can cause hydrocephalus microcephaly uh, ventriculomegaly intracerebral calcification is, is usually seen in the uh, this thing in toxoplasma only uh, there could be cataract and eye ascites so this you will be able to uh, find out in the uh, you will be able to find out in cases of uh, uh, congenital toxoplasma these are the ultrasound uh, features now uh, what is the treatment this you have to remember why you have to remember because you will get question from here and uh, this is the toxoplasma treatment now if the confirmed maternal infection is there only mother infection is confirmed the treatment will be spiramycin 1 gram three times daily and if uh, they have uh, done amniocentesis and if the fetal infection is confirmed so treatment will change so now treatment will change to spiramycin plus pyrimethamine at uh, 50 mg once daily 
and sulfur diazin 1 gram 3 times daily along with this folicinic acid 40 mg weekly okay so uh, this uh, so this is uh, this regimen will do uh, will be alternated with the spiramycin so if the fetal infection is confirmed one week uh, patient will get spiramycin treatment one week patient will get pyrimethamine and sulfur diazin treatment and with the uh, uh, with this pyrimethamine consideration for weekly blood counts has to be done okay so th uh, this is the treatment uh, apart from this serial ultrasound scan for the baby has to be done so this is a treatment for toxoplasmosis so you know uh, this being an uh, uh, protozoal infection therefore the treatment is there what what we rest we did is the, are the viral infection so there is no treatment for viral infections any question in toxoplasma Uh, ma'am, no yeah, ma uh, ma yes. uh, here they say weekly full blood count is necessary for both mother and the baby. The baby is like we have to do cordosynthesis or something while taking pyrimethamine. Uh, the cordosynthesis, uh, I don't think so. You know, the, it cannot be done every week. It cannot so be it done every week. It 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 has, it has to, to be, be mothers. Uh, yeah, it has to be mothers But because you can't poke baby every week for a uh, fetal for that counts. Right, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. And the surveillance with ultrasound is uh, how often, ma'am? Usually, uh, uh, they do one to two weekly, fortnightly. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have to tell you about the measles also. Though, uh, so I have not put the slide in details because uh, measles question I have never seen, you know. But uh, as it is one of the reason for maculopapular rash, one of the differential diagnosis for it. Therefore, I have just put it. So uh, a few things you have to know. Only this much. So if uh, like uh, when a patient has come with a history of maculopapular, like uh, any. Um, Uh, she has a contact with a person who has measles then you will take history uh, to whether she has uh, taken two doses of vaccine or not if the she has taken two doses of vaccine so you will reassure and you will uh, go ask her please go back home but if she is uh, she does not know anything then you have to do for igg testing so in measles they are only doing igg okay you have to remember this like in chicken pox guideline we when we we were uh, doing test for chicken pox we were doing i uh, varicella zoster immunoglobulins only uh, g uh, igg only here also igg testing is done for measles okay in rest infection we are doing complete serology g and m but for measles we are only doing g if g is detected we will ask patient go back but if g is not detected okay if g is not detected that means this patient is at risk so consideration for like uh, um, uh, then consideration for uh, a human normal immunoglobulin can be done it can be given within 6 days of contact like same kind of treatment we were doing from our guideline for chicken pox also okay in chicken pox we were giving immunoglobulins within 10 days of contact here we are giving within 6 days of contact fine so this is a slight a slight different and here once the baby is born so baby will also be given immunoglobulin globulin if a mother develops rash either 6 days before delivery or 6 days after delivery only this much is enough to know about measles because i have never seen you know questions from measles Ma'am, yes. Ma'am, is there any uh, difference between the macular papular rash in measles and rubella, ma'am? Because there was one no. recall question. In that, uh, no, no, no. in that, even a rash behind the ear. Some people argue it is a measles. Some telling us a rubella, ma'am. 
okay so uh, you know usually this uh, rubella is uh, other word of rubella is also german measles so measles and rubella they present same way okay so i will read about pattern of rash but both have maculopapular rash so it is bo both are the differential diagnosis of mac uh, this uh, uh, maculopapular rash Me uh, uh, rubella also measles also that much details about rash where it appears first i have to read but uh, my from my uh, pg knowledge uh, in measles first rash appears behind the ear okay but you know i i, have, I will confirm it because i don't remember right now where the rash appears first but differential for this mrcog purpose you have to know the differential diagnosis of maculopapular rash only three measles rubella and parvovirus that much information is enough okay okay ma'am thank you ma'am yeah and varicella zoster i will i will just say few words only because whole guideline is there so i am not going to in details about varicella zoster so vesicular rash so till now we were doing maculopapular rash so if in the pregnancy vesicular rash happens so there will be two diagnoses either we are dealing with varicella zoster or we are dealing with herpes okay so in varicella zoster more 90% of the patient is already immune in uk primary infection it occurs 3 in per 1000 pre pregnancy this number you will find questions and uh, this number is important to remember then uh, um, uh, so incubation period is 8 to uh, 81 days okay that also we know and patient is infectious for 2 days before until the uh, vesicles are crusted so you will get you usually get question from these two lines also now uh, if uh, when a patient comes and she has got a like a history of contact so what you will do first you will take history Or from this woman about the, um, the chicken pox in, uh, infection, and if anyone has chicken pox, so they usually remember that situation. So if she confirms, okay, if she confirms that she had got uh, chicken pox previously in life, so you you kind of reassure to this woman. But if your patient is not confirmed about previous uh, immunity. then you have to take history of significant contact what is the significant contact whether there had been face to face contact for 5 minute uh, or whether uh, she was sitting with the same patient in a same room for 15 minutes you can this is the significant contact okay if the significant uh, contact is there this patient is at a risk so if the patient is at a risk now what you will do then you have to do some test for her and test you will usually do is the varicella zoster immunoglobulins so uh, according to you know we already know that chicken pox guideline if it, uh, if igg is positive will uh, ask that woman to go home and if she uh, if it is negative then she is at risk then consideration for that immunoglobulins can be done now what you have to remember and why i have this put this slide is, is this for fetal varicella syndrome so the, uh, the uh, you can get question from this what can happen in fetal varicella so skin uh, uh, lesions are there skin scars and loss this is the most common lesion and usually it is according to the dermatome uh, dermatol dermatological uh, uh, like distribution of skin lesion will be according to the dermatomes okay and this is a most common uh, feature that can happen in fetal varicella syndrome neurological problem can ha happen limb uh, it also affect limb okay limb paresis can be there limb hypoplasia or limb reduction can be there this is one of the feature you know you will find in fetal varicella syndrome apart from this microcephaly uh, um, horner syndrome encephalitis all this thing can happen and eye problem can happen so it is affecting everything if you are finding fetal varicella syndrome in your question look for this skin lesions these are characteristic of uh, sorry this varicella and look for this limb paresis or limb hypoplasia 
this is also characteristic of uh, fetal varicella syndrome okay usually it occurs uh, in first 28 weeks of pregnancy and uh, incidence is less than 1% okay so that uh, that is all about uh, um, chicken pox i had to say rest how to manage chicken pox in pregnancy uh, we do have a guideline so i would be i would not be including that because today i wanted to talk only about fetal infections so this is a sum up uh, uh, table i have uh, like made so that uh, you'll be able to you know this um, if you just see this table um, the day before exam, so all the number of infectivity or transmission rate, what you have to remember, you'll be able to find it out from here. So, uh, here, so here is the incubation period. Here uh, is the infectious time. Here is the transmission rate. And here is the fetal infection. I'm not reading it again because we have already discussed this. I will send a screenshot of this so that you you people will it will be easy for you people to revise it before the exams okay these are again few numbers you have to remember and uh, 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 because you will find question from every uh, number of it okay so these are the transmission risk for uh, um, cmv for parvo and for rubella and for toxoplasma i will send a screenshot of this so that this will help you in deciding okay this is again a table i will send a screenshot of that also so this will be like sum up of what we have just done okay so any so now teaching part is over any question you can ask otherwise uh, you can do some questions ma'am in cytomegalovirus uh, yes, the uh, risk of transmission is highest in the third trimester, 80%, correct, ma'am? And there was one number, 14%. So that is for congenital anomalies or what? I just wanted to confirm that because you said before 14 weeks, the maximum uh, effect, whatever is there, will happen. There was one number, 14%. No, it was 14 weeks. 14 weeks. Yeah, yeah, sorry. 14 weeks. Before 14 weeks, like whatever has to happen will happen. So that is with regard to the congenital anomalies, is it? Yes, that will. That was congenital infection, congenital defect. What can happen? This is only the rate of transmission. Why I have okay. created this? Because you will find, uh, like, uh, you always find question from these numbers. Okay, so yeah, uh, risk of transmission is 40 percent, but fetal, uh, uh, like congenital damage that can happen to uh, CMV virus. That is maximum in first 14 weeks. Okay, so though 80% uh, vertical transmission is there in third trimester, but it has less effect because maximum anomalies yes. happen before 14 weeks. Yes, yes. Okay, okay, ma'am. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Yes. Ma'am, yes. uh, can I know is there anything precautions regarding the MMR vaccine? Rick, because uh, we are having one question in the Prabhasin Hawk regarding the anti D uh, giving and also the MMR vaccine at the same time. Is there any precaution or anything regarding the MMR vaccination and during that time giving the anti D and also the live vaccines? Uh, live vaccine and anti D. Yes, yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, MMR vaccination, live vaccine at the same time, and MMR vaccination and anti D at the same time. This is okay. Yeah, I think even I have seen that question once, but I don't remember. So, uh, MMR is a live vaccine and anti D. If, if the patient has to be given both, so what I remember from my knowledge. They can be given together, but sites has to be different. Okay, but I would reconfirm that. I, I will uh, go through like that part again, and I will uh, reconfirm that. I will put that uh, in the group. But in my opinion, if the patient has to be uh, given MMR or uh, and the NTD in the postnatal period, so they can be given, but the sites will be different. Okay, they will be given at different sites. 
but i will research for the evidence then i will put it in the group okay this is thank the question you, you asked yes ma'am yes ma'am thank you okay okay so now uh, you can go for you can answer questions so i was able to get very less questions it's cmv cmv cytomegalovirus yes, cytomegalovirus rubella rubella yes pda rubella yeah rubella pda pda is rubella zika virus ma'am zika virus yes it is it can be cmv also but there is a uh, history of visit from uh, cuba ma'am travel cuba Yes, uh, yeah, that goes with the. So, if the microcephaly is there, so usually two uh, two virus uh, are responsible. One is CMV, another is Zika. So now, if you had a uh, um, confusion in the exam with the Zika, they will always give a history of travel. Okay, so the things will be clear then. Is eight to twenty-eight days, mummy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Is it C high affinity? What you are saying? High affinity is suggestive of primary infection. This is wrong. Affinity has to be low for A. A, ma'am. A. A. But in CMV virus, IgM antibodies can be there for long interval of time. so it cannot uh, burn, uh, d burn. Ma yes. yes it is d it is d why i have said so as a risk of transmission is higher if it is required in first trimester but it is 40% Madam, can you explain this high avidity again? Uh, for uh, C, C. Uh, what was the reason that this is not right? In primary infection, avidity is always low. Okay, so if um, higher avidity, it cannot be primary infection. Higher in higher avidity, it has to be um, secondary infection or old infection. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Ma'am, you said. Yeah, with respect yes. to CMV, CMV, toxoplasma, and rubella, we look at this avidity. No, ma'am. In all the three, it is the number is the same, like thirty percent for uh, low yeah. and sixty percent for high. Okay, yeah. Yeah. thank you. Reassure. I'm questioning. Reassure. Reassure. Question again, ma'am. Okay. So answer is reassure. This is the question.
termination of pregnancy ma'am termination of pregnancy yes so answer has to be offer termination of pregnancy following thorough counseling so in your options if one option is termination and second option is termination uh, following the counseling so your answer will be termination following counseling so whenever you um, do emq in the exam okay so best idea will be uh, read the question look for all buzzword and after that uh, uh, just think uh, uh, answer in your head then answer what you have already put in your head just search for that in the, um, the given options so then you'll be able to do it very well reassurance ma'am yes again reassure these are the option this is the question question again ma'am options ma'am options ma'am L vaccinate the mother against rubella so here this patient uh, she has come for pre conception counseling she gives history of rubella vaccination okay she has she gives history of uh, but booking bloods are done that shows she is not immune so if she is not immune what you will do you will give her vaccine yeah ma'am actually but it is given mother na she is not conceived so i got little confused yeah, because it, it is, this is we have just vaccinated yeah she cannot be the mother so that's yes. what we thought yeah yeah she uh, she has come for pre conception counseling so uh, and you, uh, blood test is done she is not immune so before pregnancy give her vaccine reassure her yes it is reassure b ma'am B ma'am, IgG positive, IgM negative. I low avidity, IgM D. low avidity. D D. D. Yes, B. answer. No B. It cannot be B. If the uh, avidity is low, low avidity means primary infection. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so answer uh, answer will be D. Maternal serum positive for G and negative for M. So we are very happy with the IgG positive and IgM negative. Okay. Parvo virus B19. Yes. B19. Yes, and. Uh, CMB. 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 Yes, easy question.
D. D, ma'am. D. Yes, D. Because reinfection will be less likely. Yes, D is the answer. A. 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 No, Parvo was how much? Yes. 15 yeah, weeks, no, 15, 25 after that, 20, and 70. 70. Yeah, only. Only. Yes, answer has to be A. I don't know why, why the book writes C. It has to be A. Okay, that's all.